see. So welcome to the 2021 Counterculture Labs uh, Community Project Showcase. Um, sorry, I turned on the recording a little bit late, so we just heard from uh, the DIY gene gun folks uh, building a, a gene gun six shooter and a, D, a gene gun Gatling gun. Um, and we, let's see, Jessica, who else do we have uh, next? Uh, let's see, coming up next, how about Tim? Would you like to walk us through the Open Trans related projects? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? A All little right. quiet. Always a little quiet these days. <laughs> I've been playing with new microphones and uh, always gets me in trouble. Cool. Uh, great. So I can share screen. Uh, let me just pull this guy out. And I will talk a little bit about some of the robot stuff that we've been doing. So, uh, okay. Can we see the slides? And is it in like presentation mode? Yes. Yes and yes. Awesome. Great. Um, so I've been kind of working a lot with uh, robots generally at Counterculture Labs. Um, and so uh, there's lots and lots of different things this touches. So I'm just going to kind of go over a few of them and talk about uh, some of the cool things we can do with robots here and um, kind of invite you to, uh, you know, come join, talk about robots and stuff. Uh, so that first off, why robots? Well, because microbes and robots are friends. They work really well together. Um, biology, uh, is a sort of science that works at scale and robots are really helpful with that. So it helps us do kind of really interesting science if we automate, which we already saw actually with the Griffison project and the, uh, the gene gun is already kind of doing a lot of the similar stuff. And maybe we should even talk a little after because uh, I, think, I think there might be some synergies. Um, but what do we work on? Uh, it's really broad. I mean, there's no particular project that, that we're working on in this sort of robotics group here, um, except that we kind of just do anything where we automate for fun and the collective good. Um, and uh, so basically, I kind of broke this presentation down into roughly three parts. One is to talk about like, how do we help members automate their experiments? We have the tools at CCL. Um, and uh, for any of the projects that we're gonna present tonight, uh, there's probably opportunities to, to do them a little faster or uh, increase the scope. Uh, we also kind of make and hack automation tools. Uh, a lot of this is DIY, so we're just sort of figuring out how to do it. Um, and finally, I, I want to talk a little bit about this distributed cloud lab idea that I've been working on um, for probably more than a year at this point uh, and kind of uh, the possibilities for that going forward. And I think we should all just appreciate this GIF I was so happy to make today. Um, <laughs> I'm very proud of it. But um, yeah, so uh, what do we have at CCL? Well, kind of the core of it is uh, if you haven't been to the lab, uh, certainly not in a while, but if you haven't been to the lab ever, we do have this OpenTron's uh, OT2 robot. And um, it has a single channel pipettes and multi-channel pipettes. And essentially what, these, uh, what this robot does is it sort of takes the place of a uh, person holding a pipette to move liquids around. So instead you can have the robot do that and save your time for all the other things you wanna do. Um, that's kind of like the, the, the core of what we're doing uh, in the robotics group, uh, mostly because it's the, the thing that is like assembled and works. Um, so if you want to like put something out there, you can, you can start going on this pretty quick. Uh, CCL also has a 3D printer, uh, which can be really useful for doing a lot of the kinds of stuff we're doing. And then uh, we have loads and loads of parts that are sort of ready for hacking. Um, and uh, here's just kind of a big laundry list, but it's kind of all kinds of things that you might want if you wanted to do some kind of like makery stuff with electronics, um, especially in the biospace. Um, just to kind of give you a sense of what the OpenTrans is doing, this is a pretty short GIF, but um, you can kind of see uh, it's just picking up some liquid. It got it from up here in these uh, liquid wells and it's depositing it here onto plates and you can program it to do it in all kinds of patterns. Um, or repeats or, or whatever you, your needs are. Um, so I wanted to really emphasize in, in this showcase specifically that this is actually really doable. OpenTrans has done a great job of uh, making this really easy to get started with. So the OpenTrans is all open source and there's a lot of ways in and you can actually make it do some kind of 
pretty cool, like kind of backflips and stuff if you're uh, handy with some code. But it's also really easy to get started at designer.opentrons.com. They have this graphical interface tool. And so long as you can kind of think about where you would put your labware on a, on a, a bench, you can kind of use this in a point and click kind of way um, to uh, design what you want the robot to do. And then it just spits out a file that you can give to the robot. Um, so I recorded a quick, uh, quick little video here. And I actually have a longer one as well. Um, for uh, anyone who's actually really interested in, in uh, getting started in this and kind of wants like a tutorial, a quick start kind of thing. But you can see here, it's just kind of a lot of clicking. It sort of graphically shows you where stuff is going to go. And um, in this case, you can see now I've got, I moved these four dies into each of these wells over here and it, it's a piece of cake. Um, so I just want to emphasize that this is an opportunity or um, this is a, a possibility that's really open to any, any CCL lab member. Um, and I'm definitely uh, happy to help you kind of get comfortable with the hardware when we get to that phase. But um, considering that we're not open right now, this is a, probably a great time to actually do some designing some experiments and uh, sort of laying out, okay, this is what I would want to do. And then we can just get it on the machine. Um, so uh, when you're thinking about what kinds of things you might want to do, um, robots are really good at prepping solutions, uh, not a huge amounts, obviously. Uh, you can't do leaders, but uh, if you want a whole range of formulations, it's really, really easy to program that in. So if you were, say, trying to formulate media and you weren't quite sure what media your microbe grew best in, it would be really easy to do a pretty pretty big experiment uh, with that. Serial solutions are also a piece of cake and they happen really fast on robots. Overnight sampling might get complicated, but if, for instance, you need something to get sampled at 3 a.m., uh, there's probably some way to figure that out, depending on exactly what the needs are there. Um, and then you could even imagine going as broad as uh, testing a genomic library and just sort of growing uh, a broad range of different um, different microbes and just kind of seeing, well, which ones worked well, which ones worked worse, and it's a good way to uh, narrow that down. All of this kind of sums up to, it's good at doing a simple thing a lot of times. Um, and so that means you can test a lot of options. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to bring that out. I, I really think the Opentrons at CCL is probably underutilized. Um, it probably sits still a little more than it needs to. And so uh, kind of the point of all these slides was to point out like, hey, this is something that, that you can jump into. If, if you're thinking about like, ah, oh, boy, I wish I could do that experiment, but it would take forever. It's probably a way to automate at least a part of it. Um, and I'm happy to help. Uh, and so you shoot me an email or you can email uh, ccl-robotics at googlegroups.com. Um, that, that'll be at the end of the presentation. So. Uh, so what else are we doing? That's just using the robot that we have. That's great. But there's a lot of things robots aren't necessarily good at naturally, but we can kind of hack them into ways where they are good. Uh, and so here's just a, a handful of projects that we've been kind of noodling on. Um, and then there's, there's a big, huge world of other possibilities. Uh, what's really neat about this space is that um, a lot of the infrastructure that sort of the biology space is slowly building up. Um, the kind of makers have had for, you know, 10 years uh, earlier. And so, um, so there's lots and lots of ways to try to hack stuff and, and to kind of use pre-built tools and put them together in different ways. Uh, so one is we're looking at uh, making a plate reader, a way to just look at expression of a reporter protein. Um, if you wanted to do a screen, for instance, uh, colony picking is always a hot topic. Uh, we're trying to work that out. Um, we've been talking to, um, to Jan over at Bugs uh, uh, for the Open Insulin Project, as well as um, uh, some of the people down at BioCurious as well. And um, it's, a, it's a neat idea. It has some challenges, but it has a lot of really cool kind of technology under, underlying it. We've also been talking about getting a plate handling arm. This just seems fun. You just go into these robots here, uh, these little arms. Um, the, the expensive ones are kind of expensive, but the cheap ones are like 50 bucks. Uh, we probably want to go somewhere in between, but uh, I think we could actually do a lot of neat stuff with that, um, especially as far as experimentation. Uh, it's great to not have something locked into the robot. You could have it be taken out of the robot and put, I don't know, in a freezer, or put somewhere else. You can start to think about like, oh, maybe we can make assembly lines or something for a rather complex experiment. Um, and also we've been talking about and kind of had like the very beginnings of this HEPA filter project. And that's basically just to uh, make our working surfaces uh, a lot less um, uh, likely to get contaminated. Um, so you get better results. Uh, it doesn't exactly sound like a sexy project until you've had 10 million plates contaminated and you're like, we have to fix this. So uh, that's something we've been working on as well. So these are the kinds of hacks. It's like the idea is like, let's do some 
um, some 3D printing. Let's do some uh, CAD design. Uh, and then let's wire up some stuff and, and have it support the science that we want to do. So there's a lot of cool ideas in there and definitely open to a lot more of them. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is this idea that I've been working on. Um, and uh, I'm actually excited. I, con I convinced um, an institute in, in France to uh, fund part of this. Uh, so um, that'll be a six month fellowship that I'll be doing working on this. But um, I think we kind of want to see if we can keep it going as a, as a CCL project as well, because it was sort of born out of CCL. Uh, so the idea is you can imagine that uh, if you wanted to program the OpenTrons, you could have a piece of software that says, oh, well, we have a pretty standardized experiment that we want to run. So I'm just going to go to some website, program it, and it'll spit out uh, some instructions for the robot. And that's pretty close to the designer that we talked about. Um, we think that if we kind of build it on this open source stack here, so we write it in Python, which is open source, uh, use the OpenTrons, which is all open source and uh, pretty affordable if you buy it off the shelf, and then really focus on um, open MTA strains and plasmids, uh, then basically you can make this thing, a, a sort of design like this, very affordable and easy to replicate. So maybe you have one at CCL and then someone else, oh, okay, I could do the same thing. You make like an instructable. And then uh, you know somebody in a home lab decides they wanna do it or even a university. So you can sort of replicate this idea um, of being able to simply program something pretty simple and then just get instructions for the robot to do it. And then where it starts to get really fun is that it's also easy to collaborate because why do you need all those separate clouds when you could just have a single hub for all this stuff? And it becomes a way for different community labs, universities, people who are not getting you know, $10 million grants to figure out a way to do more science faster. Uh, through collaboration. So this is kind of the idea that we've been working on. We've got a software uh, suite that's already built out. Um, and it's just sort of, there's, there's just kind of a lot of uh, discussions about like, okay, how do you actually do this though? Um, the way we started doing it is with this thing called the BioArtBot, which grew out of something at CCL uh, around making uh, art on agar. Uh, so the idea is that it's like an educational cloud lab and we wrote some software that lets you just kind of draw a little picture. And then we have color producing E. coli at uh, CCL. And we just uh, spit out those instructions to print it onto our open trans liquid handling robot. And the result is a bunch of E. coli that grow together to look like Pikachu. <laughs> um, so the idea is that this is just like fun and it's a good way to get started uh, thinking about these kinds of topics. And it's a good way to sort of just jump into synthetic biology or uh, this kind of work because it's all pretty straightforward. The experiments are not deeply complicated. You're basically just trying to make a fun picture, um, but all the basics are there. Uh, we talk about, um, okay, well, why do the E. coli produce color? How do you get them to express the right proteins? Uh, then there's um, the robotics side, which is a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today. And then also um, the software side, there's a lot of sort of website architecture, internet stuff, um, and sort of, uh, we're kind of chasing at that utopia of, you know, what the, what the internet was dreamed to be as a sort of collaboration hub um, so that we can all kind of improve. Um, so I'm actually gonna talk about this uh, a lot more in depth next week um, at, our, at our meeting uh, to go into a lot of the ways that we've been approaching this and thinking about this. Um, but uh, for now you can kind of see like, basically we just kind of grow one colony at every pixel point and the robot works for that. And uh, we piloted it, gosh, it feels like years ago now, I guess it was 2019. Um, and we grew 36 kind of drawings. We got submissions from around the world. And um, yeah, we're trying to work out how to develop this further and make this something that could actually be uh, both uh, an educational tool and then eventually grow into that distributed loud cloud lab concept. Um, Tim, what is the best way for people to get involved in this project? You're, you ah, aren't yes. currently doing meetups, right? No, no. So we're not doing meetups at this point. Um, uh, though uh, I am I am kind of considering restarting that uh, as we kind of just sort of sit around and twiddle our thumbs and wait for uh, wait for the pandemic to be looking a little better. Um, but uh, right now, um, we have a mailing list, CCL Robotics at Google Groups. 
Uh, and you can also check out the BioArtBot project specifically at bioartbot.org. Um, and then, uh, yeah, if you want to talk more, just email me at timdobbs at gmail. Um, and I can also uh, facilitate you getting onto this mailing list so that you get everything that you need there. Um, and then when, when we start doing more meetups, uh, then it'll go out on that mailing list. Oh, great. And Patrick has, has shared the, uh, the doc yeah. for signing up. So um, yeah, you can sign up for multiple there. Otherwise, it's a little bit of a hassle to do it through Google Groups directly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that's just, it's a, it's a broad talk. Uh, at this point, questions, uh, thoughts? I do. This is Ramey. Um, I'm wondering, wouldn't, wouldn't COVID be a perfect time to explore the lab cloud concept? Yeah, uh, that's definitely what kind of kicked, kicked us into gear on, on that particularly. Um, to be honest, to be totally honest with you, uh, it's just kind of, I just kind of felt the sort of doldrums uh, in the last month or two and, um, and then have been thinking about, okay, well, how do we get uh, the robot side going. But um, yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think we want to be, uh, this is a great time to be working on this cloud lab stuff and really talking it out. Um, so look for, uh, look for some emails uh, to talk about um, how we're going to get going again. And I, I hope some people kind of join in and, and kind of bring some, some fresh energy. And speaking of COVID-19, uh... We are also hoping to do more live streaming from the wet lab in the future. So we would have a single person in the lab, uh, maybe working on the, the robot in person, and then live streaming it to everybody else who wants to follow along. So that'd be a great opportunity to, maybe even people controlling the robots from remotely, but then actually having someone in the lab to like swap out plates or troubleshooting if something goes wrong with the hardware. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, well, that's what I've got. Uh, like I said, be in touch. And uh, definitely, if, if you want to support your own uh, science on the robot as well, uh, let's do it. Thank you so much, Tim. That was yeah really interesting. And I uh, had no idea we had all those capabilities. So thanks for talking about them. <laughs> yeah, just got to get it out there. We got a lot of lot of cool stuff we can do. Well, thank you. Um, and keeping on the topic of COVID, Patrick, did you want to talk about COVID chats or? Sure, I can do that. Uh, let's see. Grab my slide. All right, so everybody can see that one. Oops, it's uh, probably blacked out now. Okay. Yes, we can see. All right. So uh, COVID chat is something that we started in collaboration with BioCurious actually uh, way back when, um, back in March, in fact, during the, the initial lockdowns, uh, we realized that a bunch of us were constantly doom scrolling the bad news about COVID-19 anyway. And, and sort of digging into all these preprints that were coming out. And, and nobody really has enough bandwidth to follow all of the news and signs that is coming out on a weekly basis. So we started having these uh, uh, weekly uh, discussion sessions on Saturday mornings, uh, sort of going over all of the, the, the latest news and uh, signs articles uh, from the week. Um, so... We typically have a number of people uh, collecting some uh, things that they come across during the week and we put them all in a Google Doc. And then on Saturday morning, we sort of go through that list and sort of discuss what are the interesting features and uh, what are the various connections with things that we've read before. Uh, or is this preprint even worth anything? Or what are the experts on Twitter saying about this study that just came out and stuff like that? Um, so we're also collecting a whole bunch of really useful resources that we want to have everybody access to. Um, 
we do try to avoid getting into politics because we know a number of us would just not get out of that uh, black hole if we ever got into it. So uh, there's tons of discussion about policy often, but once it veers too much into politics, we try to stay away from that. Um, so we do have a running document with all of our notes and essential resources, and you have a link there. And actually, I just wanted to show you what uh, what's in there right now. We've been I've been putting in a couple of links. A couple of other people have been putting in links. Um, so it starts out with our our resources, sort of who are the people to follow online on social media. Uh, and then we've already put together a section for January 9th, which is the next uh, next Saturday coming up. And yeah, we have some stories about, you know, there's a uh, hospital in Mendocino, their frozen freezer broke and they were able to vaccinate 800 people in two hours time. You know, that's how fast it can go. Some news about the new South America, South African COVID variant that might uh, cause problems with some of the antibody based drugs and some of the vaccines. Um, Ginkgo is starting a new project to vaccinate, or sorry, to uh, to do pool testing for all of the K to 12 schools. Uh, so lots of interesting stuff that's coming up from uh, the past week. Um, we, as part of this, uh, these COVID chats, we also started sort of a, uh, a hardware project on the side. Um, that's called our Mascomatic project. Um, and the goal there is to build a testing rig uh, to test various mask making materials or DIY masks for uh, filtration efficiency and breathability. So uh, and we're, we're basing this on a design that the folks at Smart Air had put together a while back actually to test masks against air pollution in Beijing. Um, and it's simply, so it's a, a, a tube where you push some air in with a, with a, a little fan. Uh, and then you put a mask at the end of the tube here and you're using a particle counter. This is a laser particle counter. You're measuring how many particles are coming through the mask with the mask in place or without the mask there. And the difference tells you the filtration efficiency for the mask. Um, so we're going to be expanding on that a little bit. Um, there we're using a $2,000 laser particle filter. We were able to find some $50 uh, laser particle counters. So we can actually afford to have two of them, one before and one after the mask. So we don't have to run this thing twice just to get the filtration efficiency. Uh, we can also put a pressure sensor across the mask uh, to test for the breathability of the material, essentially. Um, so that uh, that project is well underway. We have all of the our hardware. We just need to put it together and uh, start collecting data. Essentially, uh, we could definitely use more help on the hardware and the software, and then actually running testing runs. Uh, so the Maskomatic project uh, that happens at the end of our COVID chat sessions on Saturdays at uh, 11:45. So uh, COVID chat. 10 o'clock till noon, and then the last 15 minutes of that is a uh, mass schematic. So, any questions on that? Otherwise, we can go to the next one. It's a uh, A lot of so, information people might find very useful. Yeah, yeah. And so several of the, the folks that are on here today are involved in these COVID okay. chats as well. I have found them tremendously useful. Uh, and we have a really good mix of people that have some sort of key background knowledge and then people that know more about the policy side and just people that read a lot of news and find articles that none of us had found. So. All right, if there's no other questions, then we'll go to the next one. Great, thank you. Um, Lance, did you want to talk about real vegan cheese? Sure, let me just pull up the screen here.
exactement. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, but you're not in presentation mode at the moment, which is fine depending on how big your phones are. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll enter presentation mode. There might be a lag. It seems my internet connection is unstable, so please interrupt if you have trouble uh, hearing me. You might turn off your video just to save a little bandwidth if that's struggling. That sounds like a brilliant idea. All right. I'm Lance. I, as I mentioned, um, help lead our business development efforts at Real Vegan Cheese. And just brief background in terms of our motivation for existence. Uh, some quick facts about the dairy industry. Um, you know, nearly 300 million dairy cows in existence. Uh, which is a huge number of animals. Uh, the milk industry is inherently tied to the veal industry, which most people will agree is problematic to say the least. Huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions directly attributable to the dairy. Huge amount of water wastage compared to non-dairy milk options and considerable pollution from dairy farms. Issues not included here are also antibiotic use, which is huge zoonotic diseases, which we're all living some of the consequences of those, and just general environmental degradation due to industrialized dairy. And on the greenhouse gas front, um, a huge amount of water um, goes, essentially that contributes to global warming. Huge amount of water is going towards feeding these animals. And as alluded to before, for not just dairy, industry, but overall animal agriculture contributes about 18%, which is more than all transportation sectors combined. And livestock take up 40% of Earth's habitable land, which is an absurd number. Livestock or food raised to feed livestock. And so, you know, clearly there are a lot of problems with dairy, and we're all aware of these problems, but we, most of us, um, still proceed to consume. And so um, a big motivation for a Real Vegan Cheese Project is why that is. And so before we dive into some of those questions, first want to give a brief milk and cheese science 101. Uh, so milk is broadly composed of two types of proteins. You have your caseins, which are important for cheese formulation. And then you have whey, which um, is essentially the liquid that remains when cheese curdles from milk. The structure of casein when it comes to cheese formation is shown in the infographic at the top, where the exterior, essentially casein aggregates together to form a casein micelle. The outer um, layer of this micelle is, consists of kappa casein, and the interior is filled with alpha S1, alpha S2, and beta casein. With the addition of um, chymosin, which is rennet, you have the aggregation of these casein micelles, and they coagulate into cheese curds. And that's the curdling process that is used to produce cheese. So getting back to our original question, why, why real vegan cheese? Um, as you can see before, huge problem for the environment in terms of industrialized animal agriculture, but we do have fundamental recognition that um, for most people, it is hard to give up cheese. And so uh, fundamentally as the third bullet point shows, we believe that um, you can have your cake and eat it too, and that we can create real actual animal-based or you know, animals like cheese that is not from animals, but is instead fermented by bacteria, but it has the same taste, texture, and other properties of um, a cow-derived cheese. Brief history of the project, which far predates my time. 
the Real Vegan Juice Project initially started as a 2014 the best lab, lab project award um, in the community lab space. Following that um, award, we launched a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo, which raised $37,000. And the project has uh, remained in existence ever since. Dive into some of the nitty gritty details about our process. This is a very simplified schematic and I'll get into a more detailed to get involved. At a high level though, we will essentially um, use bioinformatics resources to search for the uh, genetic sequence for the casein proteins that are used to form cheese. We then will synthesize yeast DNA, insert that DNA into our host chassis, which is either yeast or bacteria. In this case, we're discussing yeast. We'll brew them at lab scale, bench scale in the lab, uh, collect and purify the casein proteins from those yeast, reconstitute them into milk, and then use that to produce cheese as one high level path. And there are questions about fundamental economics and what have a from a business perspective, a fundamentally attractive product. But one way you can think about it is we only have to achieve a fairly low titer of two and a half grams per liter for five grams of cheese to be essentially the price of uh, you know, expensive, but not $250,000 beer. Long story short, we've gotten a lot of press for this project. Um, and a big motivation for our project is not only the fundamental science and the environmental aspect of um, the harms of animal agriculture, but also as a way to change the public perceptions of synthetic biology. When this project got started, uh, this was, you know, I believe may have been one of the first projects, if not the first project, where. Um, there was this use of recombinant proteins to produce a commodity animal product. Um, and it came at a time in which the perception of synthetic biology was at a particular nadir, low point. You can see from the table uh, currently displayed that when it comes to creating novel foods from chemicals or other food products, uh, pretty universal negative perception uh, this was back in 2014 um, because of projects like Real Vegan Cheese, as well as companies like Impossible Foods and many others. That perception is beginning to change where um, synthetic biology as a term doesn't have as bad of a reputation as GMO or genetic engineering. And now that it's being associated particularly with creating more sustainable, more ethical and novel and tasty food products, Perceptions definitely shifted since Real Vegan Cheese first got started. And as alluded to before, a big motivation for the start was to change perceptions of GMOs. Our end product isn't in and of itself a GMO in that it, there are no organisms in our end product after it's purified. But of course the casein is created using a genetically altered yeast strain. And the genetic altering that occurs is the insertion of that casein or milk protein, uh, or rather the genetic sequence for that milk protein into the yeast. And so talks about why GMOs aren't universally bad. A lot of the bad rap is because of um, bad actors in the space like Monsanto who have um, kind of tainted the field by um, leveraging genetically modified organisms for primarily profit-driven reasons that have had a del deleterious environmental impact. And so in some ways, the Real Vegan Cheese Project is the anti-Monsanto in that we are actively trying to 
leverage synthetic biology and genetic engineering for good and to benefit the environment rather than um, maximize profits. I alluded earlier to specific projects that we're engaged with. This uh, schematic's a little busy, and so I'll, using my cursor, highlight a more detailed version of our process and ways that, especially during COVID, volunteers can get involved. I mentioned that, of course, casein that we use is currently derived from cows or bovine sources. But we can also investigate non-bovine sources for cheese production. Um, even if something as outrageous as a narwhal, which I'll touch on in a bit, but things more conventional, such as yaks or really any um, milk producing mammal. And the idea behind exploring beyond the cow would be potentially you can find casein proteins that are more functional and have better taste, texture, or coagulation properties than do bovine proteins. And so you have a higher value, better product than anything we can get on the market currently. So there's research around the physical properties of the proteins, how they match to functional properties, which is, again, coagulation, emulsification, um, et cetera. And then from those that more bioinformatics heavy work, there's the actual wet lab work, which is uh, engineering our strains, producing them in lab to test for expression and purify, and then scaling up that process to a more commercial level. So this is the lab work side. And then you have more of the food science side around taking these raw curds that we could produce and enzymatically modifying them or reconstituting them with fats and sugars that are plant-based in order to produce a finished cheese product. And so there's the reconstitution phase, there's the addition of plant-based fats and sugars, and there's the investigation of cheese ripening bacteria to confer um, hardness, flavoring, and essentially enhance the value of these products. The primary ways to get involved currently on the Real Vegan Cheese core project side are around business model and bioinformatics, as well as on, on while we're essentially conducting experiments that you can do in your own kitchen and don't require necessarily um, a fully equipped lab. Who narwhal as a potential non-bovine source for casein. The long story short, um, in the interest of time, is that it began as a joke. Uh, think of the most absurd mammal that you can. Most people would probably say narwhal. And what would its milk be like? And what would it, how would one make milk into cheese? And what would that cheese taste like versus bovine, given how different narwhals are from cows? And so it was a way to just, um, playfully push the boundaries of um, this project and the science that we do. But during the lockdown, um, when we weren't able to go in the lab, we built off of this playful idea into an actual tangentially related project on the uh, phylogenetic side. And in brief, this project, um, the core questions for the project were initiated by the investigation of the narwhal genome, which had only just been published maybe a year, year and a half ago, far later than we expected. And uh, when we looked at the casein gene clusters, we noticed that they were, uh, that of course there were differences compared to other whales and other mammals, for one. And that too, there's this curious property where the casein genes were clustered pretty close to tooth development genes. And tooth development genes are um, what trigger essentially the growth of the narwhal's fanciful horn. The horn is actually a long tooth that penetrates through the head of the narwhal um, and grows out. And it's only a single tooth rather than both. 
And so uh, if you attend our bi-weekly science meetings, we have weekly meetings, but one half are um, administrative and one half are science. So if you attend our science meetings, we talk about um, some of this narwhal phylogenetics work in pretty considerable detail. And so you're welcome to attend those. Uh, details are on the meetup page for Counterculture Labs, as well as for BioCurious. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Lance. That's a lot of fun. And now I want cheese. Only vegan cheese. <laughs> when it's there, I'll eat it. Um, do we want to, anybody have any questions or anything on that? Okay, do we want to stick with some food? Oh, yeah, I have a question. When can we get some of that narwhal cheese? That's what I'm looking forward to. As soon as. <laughs> yeah, it apparently has the consistency of toothpaste. Um, milk from narwhals does, at least, because it's an underwater delivery system. And so um, we're actually quite curious what its cheese properties would be like. But uh, post pandemic, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I've actually gone through some of the literature from back in the the whaling days, you know, to see if there was any report of what narwhal cheese is like or, or whale cheese in general. Because uh, if we make this at some point, we're going to have to justify to the FDA why this is edible, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be so hard. All right. Do we want to stick with the uh, the food topic and maybe break into some mushroom talk? Yeah, I saw Alan uh, Rockefeller online. Yeah, this is good yeah Alan and Hart. I think Hart is on as well. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Hello. Hello, Hart. Hi, Ellen, were you, were you going to present a little bit about uh, mushroom work at CCL? Yeah, you know, it's been a really good year for mushrooms this year. Um, you know, I'm all set up here at home to do all the stuff I used to do at CCL. So I've been doing a lot of PCR and microscopy here. Um, <clears throat> just ran 60 PCR reactions last night. And uh, I got the mobile PCR set up now. So um, about a week ago, I did PCR in the National Forest up in Oregon <laughs> and uh, sent off uh, about 15 PCR products and 13 of them worked. So um, that's about, about the, same, the same as we were getting at CCL. So that has been good. Um, I got a couple new microscopes this year. I got a dissecting scope and a nice Nikon, Nikon scope with high-end objectives. So I got pretty good images of a lot of this stuff. And I've been traveling a lot. I went to Michigan, Utah, Oregon, Washington, and Northern California mushrooms. and made a whole lot of collections. Um, and I've been keeping track of all of them on the Citizen Science websites, uh, iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer. And uh, a naturalist says that I found uh, 1,273 species in 2020 um, and identified 40, 44,000 things for other people. Um, so even though we're spread out during, uh, due to the pandemic, um, these citizen science websites are a really good way to keep, uh, keep in touch with everybody and share uh, everything you're finding and also see what's, been, uh, what's out there right now. And right now, there's a whole lot of little sapotrophic mushrooms. Um, they're kind of all over the place. So every time I go out, um, I don't, usually don't, don't get very far because there's so many things to see and photograph. Um, I've even been finding a lot of rare stuff uh, recently. Um, in fact, uh, yesterday, last night, Hart and I um, went out to San Mateo and we found a mushroom that glows in the dark. And most of the California mushrooms that glow in the dark you just kind of glow a little bit, or maybe the stem base. But this one, the whole thing glows really brightly. Um, so I got some real cool pictures of that. 
And also I've been doing a lot of ultraviolet photography of plants and mushrooms. Um, I find these 365 nanometer uh, ultraviolet lights that have a filter to block the visible light that comes out. Um, you can make really neat photographs. Um, so I've been putting all of those on iNaturalist, uh, Mushroom Observer, Instagram, and my Facebook wall. So if you check those places, it'd be see some of my recent photography. Um, got some really cool fluorescent slime molds last night. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's what I've been up to. Um, do you have anything, Hart? A second, uh, my fan is on uh, my air purifying fan. Let me get out of that room real quick. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I've been kind of uh, putting all my mushroom stuff uh, into Bay Area Applied Mycology, um, and we're doing some cool projects there. Can everyone, everyone can hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, one thing we're working on, which is really, really cool is last year at counterculture labs uh during one of the mushroom meetups this guy aiden brought a uh a jack-o-lantern mushroom known as omphalotus olivescens that was found growing on eucalyptus and we cultured it <clears throat> at ccl and then uh we're now moving forward with a project with east bay um, municipal utility district to inoculate cut eucalyptus trees with that very specimen um, so, in, of course, in the interim, that was taken to agar plates, and then that was taken to some sterilized eucalyptus wood, and then that was taken to dowels. So we're actually in the phase of getting the permit from uh, EBMUD, and I'll be uh, meeting with one of the gentlemen from there tomorrow to, um, to finalize that, and then that'll be a great project to work on with BAM. And uh, if, uh, if any of you folks are interested, um, I can certainly... Uh, provide some information on how to how to be involved with that. As far as um, jumping back into the world of CCL mushrooms, um, I admittedly am not great with uh, distance distance situations. So uh, videos, um, I've tried to take a few videos of myself, but the editing process is just a little bit too uh, tedious for my my ADD brain. So. Um, uh, I'm really looking forward to the days when we can get back into the lab in person and start having meetups. Um, but perhaps uh, I can try to put together some video reels of some of the work I've been doing uh, and maybe uh, provide that if you guys want to use it. Hart or Alan, are, are you folks running any mushroom outings that people might want to participate in? I think outdoor events would be a, a great way to get a little bit socializing outdoors in a way that really lends itself well to social distancing. Yeah, in general, mushrooms do lead, lend themselves well to social, social distancing. Uh, sometimes people distance and other times they don't. Uh, it just really depends on the, on the crowd. Um, but, you know, the season's pretty good in California right now in the Bay Area, and it probably will not stay good for more than a couple of weeks. It looks like there's a little bit more rain and then maybe not any more after that. Um, so we probably should do some soon and remind people to stay back a little bit, uh, stay kind of separate. Um, well, but I don't have anything planned right now. Okay. I, yeah, I would personally love that, just being out in nature and uh, looking at stuff in nature. Yeah, I second that. That would be a lot of fun. So if you do decide to do something, I think you'd have some enthusiasm. Yep. Uh, where should I post it if I do? Uh, we, can, uh, we can post it on the mailing list that we have for the mycology group, uh, or we can put it straight on Meetup for that matter. Uh, yeah, How I think I have that part? to Meetup. Alan and Hart, this is Ramey. Wondering, like, what do you think in terms of handling group for forays during COVID? What do you think the max number could be? Well, I don't they think would... there's, it's really about how many people you have. It's more about how, how good they are at staying apart. Right. Um, you know, if people stand pretty far apart, there can be a lot of people and all spread out. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, it just really depends on the individuals that are in the group. Right, right. 
I feel like that at a certain point when there are like a lot of people, um, it's just harder to manage sort mm -hmm. of. The group. And so yeah, like you're right. PCL, if you have 50 people, they're, they're not going to be distanced. Exactly. So I think like um, Hart and Alan, I think what we can do too is like help kind of like set it up and, and like whether through meetup or like whatever, but a foray is definitely something I think would be wonderful during that time. And I'm just, just because we have the space here, I'm wondering, and I know that some other people said that they were interested. I wonder if there's a way to interact. Hart, I know you said you were, you know, thinking about some video reels and things like that. What are some like potential like live stream ways that you can share knowledge or interest um, I know Alan has a lot of like DNA barcoding stuff on the web, but maybe it's like something that we can kind of walk people through the procedures or something. I'm like just brainstorming about that. Certainly you could do microscope stuff, but you know, microscopy is not for everyone. There's a pretty steep learning curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Patrick just got like a, um, a not a, it's not a GoPro, but it's a similar head mounted cam that you could even take out into the field too at some point for like a, a live stream finding. Yeah, I mean, that wouldn't be live, but you could record it on the camera for sure. And you can, you can edit it or just play the whole thing either way. And like, I'd be really curious, Alan, too, in terms of um, what your home setup looks like, not to pry on in your private lab, but it'd be really cool to see that because if now you've set up what you had at CCL, sort of like how you're carrying the work uh, that you would have done at CCL in your own home, that's, that's super cool. And if we could see that, then other people can also kind of like think about ways that they can do it on their own. Yeah, I mean, it's not really too much stuff. Um, it's all packed into the car now because I just got back from Oregon. Uh, but, you know, it's a PCR machine, some pipettes, and two microscopes. Um, so, you know, it, it all fits into a couple boxes. <laughs> Great. And Hart, um, if you said the EBMUD uh, project is through BAM right now? Yeah, I'm going to just turn off this uh, air filter really quickly. Yeah, so um, it's through Bay Area Applied Mycology. It's myself, Mino, a gentleman named Justin, and a couple other people working on it. Um, so it's not like it's not going to be a huge project. And whenever we do get the permit, it's only going to be for a few people just for the sake of liability. Um, but that's something that we do plan on documenting. And so I, I'd love to share that whole experience um, with CCL in some sort of fashion. Uh, I know we're, we're currently working on the uh, Bay Area Applied Mycology website. It's it's basically in very bad shape right now, so I wouldn't recommend trying to find anything out through that. Um, uh, other than that, I think what would be a great idea um, would be some sort of uh, socially distant foray. Uh, maybe we could do something at uh, Salt Point State Park, where it's not an official for you have to have permits to take people there. But if we, for example, uh, have people go out there on their own and then and then have an ID table at the end of it, where it's not, you know, where no one's leading it per se. Uh, I don't know the legality of that, but that that might be really interesting. And that's something that you could you could certainly do a video on is the field identification. Um, you know, and that would be pretty easy to do if you have someone just just at a table looking at mushrooms and showing how to identify them. Um, and, and even just running through how you put something in iNaturalist, you know, you could literally yeah, yeah. Your, the, the, yourself putting something in there. The uh, Mycology Society of Fresno, I believe it's called, they have a really, really good video on, uh, it's a YouTube video and, and very well edited, good quality. And it goes through uh, uploading to iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer. Um, I'll see if I can find the uh, the link and, and, and email it or something later. Um, I am kind of in the middle of some lab work, so I, I, I can't really uh, jump over to the computer right now. Mm -hmm. but. I can kind of show a cursory setup of what a, a home um, mushroom culture setup would look like. And uh, so this is a, a HEPA filter that basically blows clean air at you. In this box up here is the fan and there's a, um, a UVC 
fluorescent bulb that kind of cleans the air as it comes through. And then I've got some racks to hold things up. And actually right now I'm doing PCR on a whole bunch of cultures that I have. So uh, I'm actually opening them in front of the HEPA filter so I don't uh, contaminate the cultures because they want to use them. But, you know, perhaps I could I could put something together. I'm just really terrible at video editing. I wish I wish I had more patience for it. Yeah. We should try and recruit some some other folks from the Omni who have more experience in doing that. Because I think we could produce some good content, but we don't have too many people with expertise in doing the editing. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm, I'm getting some ideas, and I think also with the, the jack-o'-lantern mus mushroom, that's like, if I'm not mistaken, that's a remediation project, right? Yeah, you could call it that. Um, so the goal would be, I never really explained what the goal there is. So after eucalyptus trees are cut, the stumps will continue to re-sprout for any number of years, up to 10 years. And uh, typically, like the East Bay Regional Parks District, the way that they'll treat that is applying uh, pesticides to the cut eucalyptus stumps. Uh, and those pesticides are water soluble from what I understand. So they'll wash off with the rain and they'll con contaminate the uh, area. But with East Bay mud, since it's watershed land, they can't uh, use pesticides. So they've been manually having to trim the sprouts that come out of these cut eucalyptus stumps. And it's a huge labor intensive process. And so uh, our thought is that using a mushroom that is not pathogenic, it's not known to be pathogenic or or parasitic per se, um, that we could uh, use a, a bioremediation strategy to prevent those trees from re-sprouting and then uh, also save them, you know, lots of labor and, and the dangerous, uh, uh, you know, task of going to some of these sites, which are, which are, um, some of them can, can be affected by other trees falling in the wind. And in any case, it's a, it's a great way of uh, potentially you know, solving that problem. So yeah, and, and even about are the folks that have been uh, cutting that, cutting back the eucalyptus on the uh, the Oakland and Berkeley Hills to uh, reduce fire risk up there. So that's uh, a, a big concern for them. Yeah. So the, this is the scope of this project would be pretty large. We'd have to we'd have to follow it for a couple of years um, in order to uh, evaluate how quickly or effectively this works. But if it does work. Uh, you have got the bonus of, um, you know, getting cool looking mushrooms coming out of your uh, eucalyptus stumps. Uh, they're also bioluminescent mushrooms. So there's a bonus in that sense as well. And they're not edible. Um, so it's not like you'd have people just breaking into Ebmud land to, to steal mushrooms. Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Well, so I if think... people are interested in uh, getting involved with more mushroom events through CCL or through Bay Area Applied Mycology, for that matter, uh, put your email in the spreadsheet and we will get you in contact with uh, the folks organizing it. Let's see, Alan, I have a question for you. Uh, yes. You received that really fantastic grant. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, uh, you know, and how, how you've been using it? Yeah, um, when I was out in uh, <clears throat> I was out in Philadelphia, and I posted some pictures to Instagram, and so somebody messaged me and said, uh, "Hey, I'd, I'd like to meet up for lunch." And so when random people from the internet message me and ask me to meet up, I always meet them because um, they always turn out to be interesting people. And he turned out to be a venture capitalist who wanted to give me a five thousand dollar grant to study mushrooms. And so I asked him uh, what what he wanted me to study exactly, um, what I should use it for. And he said, well, just whatever you want, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, but um, but here's $5,000 to do it. And um, so he actually uh, came through and sent the check to CCL um, so he could uh, write it off on his taxes and sent it to me. And then when I was um, out in Michigan, he invited me to come see his house. And I went and visited him um, a couple months ago in Vermont. And uh, he has a re really cool property out there, 50 acres of, um, of woods. And so we spent a few days there uh, hunting mushrooms on his property and made a, took a whole bunch of photos, made a whole bunch of collections. 
And so um, we found a couple of things on his property that were extremely rare, like it had only been found uh, in the United States a couple of times before. Um, so I'm going to get some DNA sequence results on that. And um, uh, but I've been using the money for uh, lots of um, microscopy stuff. I have this nice Nikon microscope with pretty good objectives, so I can take pretty good microscope pictures. And then I got this cool uh, 15 millimeter macro lens. So most macro lenses are more like 100 millimeters and uh, they do a great job of showing your subject, but they don't show the background very well at all because they're really zoomed in. So this 15 millimeter macro lens, it can focus extremely closely, but it also shows the, you can see all of the background since it's such a wide angle lens. So um, it really puts, um, puts your subject into context so you can see the habitat at the same time as being able to see this little tiny object, um, you know, and it focuses really closely. So it's like, it looks really big. Um, so that, that's a pretty neat effect. Um, and also just lots of traveling around, you know, probably made, oh, about 800 collections this year and probably say, got about 600 of them saved. Um, so uh, lots of them are new species, but, um, you know, like um, to actually publish new species is uh, is a lot of work to see if they're actually new. Uh, but certainly I can do a lot of sequencing and figure out if they might be new. And uh, there's a few, there's about 10 of them I kind of have my eye on. So whenever I see them, I'll say, oh, I have uh, DNA sequences that I think is probably new. And I'll grab it and make more collections. Um, and that way, if I ever decide to name these things, um, I'll have a bunch of collections. Uh, because it's not a good practice to name something just based on one or two finds. Um, you know, you want to, want to have it found uh, a bunch of different times so you can like see the all the variation. Um, does that answer your question, Michael? Yeah, that was great. Sounds very exciting. All right. Uh, yeah, we still have much. a couple of projects coming up. We do indeed. Want to keep the food theme going and talk about some kombucha genomics? Sure, I can do that one. Thank you guys, that was fascinating. And now I want to eat mushrooms and cheese. <laughs> it's a complete now kombucha. Uh, let's see, let me share screen. All right, is that coming through? Yep. Yes, and there's a question about right. where the video will be posted. Uh, that is a good question. Um, we'll put it up on our YouTube channel and I will try and mail it out or mail out the link. Uh, but yes, we, we will be putting it up somewhere. It's just a good reminder as well for anybody who joined late, this is being recorded. So if you want to opt out, please let us know in the chat or by email because it will most likely be published publicly. Yes. Um, so the Kombucha Project uh, meets every other Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, so there wasn't a meeting this week. There will be one next week. Um, and we're studying this, uh, this fairly complex uh, fermentation culture. Uh, it's fermentation of black tea and sugar, essentially. Um, and if you have never heard of Kombucha, go to your nearest grocery store and they will probably have at least a dozen different flavors for you to try. Um, so it's a really cool project because it's uh, sort of a nice platform to look at a couple of different issues in fermentation cultures. Uh, so we're f studying kombucha from a, a range of different perspectives. We've been doing a lot of microbiology, especially before the lockdowns. Uh, we've had sessions just on brewing kombucha, doing taste testing. Uh, we've been digging into the biochemistry. We've been looking at sort of the, the, the cellulose production, this white layer that grows on top of the kombucha. 
that's actually bacterial cellulose that can you, you can turn into a vegan leather substitute essentially uh, so lots of different aspects that we've been looking at um, before the lockdown sort of microbiology was probably the biggest one that we worked on so we spent uh, a good amount of time uh, teaching ourselves how to make isolates from a complex culture like this. Um, so the organisms in the kombucha culture include both bacteria and yeast. So the layer growing on top is often called a SCOBY, which stands for uh, 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 what is it? synergistic co-culture of bacteria and yeast. Um, and different kombucha cultures may actually not have any organisms in common with each other. Uh, each culture itself is not highly complex. Uh, you typically have like a dozen different species or so that are there, um, but there can be a huge variety um, between the different cultures that are out there. Um, oops, there we go. I don't know why that slide didn't come up. So um, you see some of our, the, the plates we've been making, isolation plates. Um, we've been doing a good amount of sort of a, a community composition sequencing through a company called Ubiome. Um, and we've got some nice sort of more metagenomic uh, results on, on what other species in there. And the bottom right here, you see one, uh, like a, a really large piece of a, uh, sort of vegan letter that one of our members had made in a kiddie pool, essentially in her backyard. Uh, and and this material, if you ever touched it in person, it really feels sort of letter-like, um, but it has certain drawbacks. So it, it absorbs water. Uh, it tends to have a strong kombucha odor. So we've actually done quite a bit of sort of material science studies looking at. Uh, how to improve the properties of that material. Like We're getting a bunch of background. Could you make sure your mic is muted if you're not actively speaking? No, it's not a... Michelle? Like Jessica, I think you're a co-host, so you can you can mute people if necessary. Oh, let, me, let me actually mute Vishal. I think I lost it. Yeah. All right, so... Um, so now that we're all under lockdown, we've been focusing more on um, sort of the bioinformatics side. So when the lockdown happened, uh, we were just about ready to start sequencing some of our own isolates that we have gotten from uh, various kombucha cultures. We actually have about uh, two dozen different uh, bacterial and yeast isolates that are currently sitting in our minus 80 freezer. And the only thing we had to do essentially was to grow up a big batch, extract DNA and send it off to a sequencing company. Uh, so what we've been doing since is uh, we've been essentially getting a lot of practice in handling raw sequence data like that. So uh, dealing with, uh, oops, can I advance this slide? There we go. Um, looking at what are the various DNA sequencing technologies, what does raw sequencing data looks like if you're sequencing a whole genome, uh, how to assemble these raw sequences into a full genome, uh, annotating bacterial genomes, and then analyzing what metabolic pathways are there uh, to look at things like production of cellulose, uh, production of glucuronic acid, which is one of the compounds that is a uh, uh, associated with a lot of the health claims behind kombucha. Um, interesting thing about glucuronic acid is that not all kombucha cultures make glucuronic acid, and we don't really know which organism is responsible for it. So since we have a fairly large library now of different, uh, uh, both full kombucha cultures, but also isolates, we can start answering some of that question. Um, and so this is one of the projects that I'm really looking forward to uh, being able to do some live streaming. Uh, so just being able to take one of those two dozen isolates that we have in the freezer, uh, take one take one of those out, streak it out on plates, uh, growing it up to larger amounts, and then extract DNA for sequencing. You know that would be uh, probably two or three nice live streaming sessions. Would 
only require having one person in the lab at a time. Um, so yeah, we're still very actively working on this project, even though at the moment it has been mostly online. Uh, but I think we're all learning a lot about sort of the the bioinformatics side and sort of how to deal with uh, sequencing data and, and how to deal with genomes and how to study them, stuff like that. Uh, any questions on this? No, thank you, Patrick. All right. I, I have a quick question. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, someone was had mentioned to me about um, Oxford nanopore sequencing technology, and uh, it just seemed really interesting. I don't exactly um, understand its limitations, although I know it does have some. Uh, would you just quickly cover what uh, what you can contribute to that? Yeah. So uh, there's a couple of different sequencing technologies out there. What we've mostly been looking at is Illumina. Uh, Lumina sequencing, you get tons of data, but it's all in very short snippets. And then you have to, you have this giant jigsaw puzzle that you have to put together, essentially. Uh, nanopore sequencing, you get much longer sequences, but they are have a much higher error rate. So there's definite trade-offs between those. Uh, the nice thing about nanopore is that it scales very easily. You can get a sequencer for under $1,000, essentially. And you kind of start doing some of your own sequencing rather than having to farm it out to somebody else. Um, there's also some really interesting uh, technology developments that are um, that have been happening over the past couple of years with Nanopore. Um, for example, um, so Nanopore sequencing works by having uh, uh, thousands or I don't know millions probably of little tiny pores and and, and uh, through through a surface, and the sequencing happens at each of those individual pores. So you get uh, multiple DNA strands that are being sequenced simultaneously. Uh, so they've recently figured out uh, how to look at the initial data that's coming out of one of those pores. And if it doesn't look like it's an interesting DNA, you can actually reverse the pore and just spit the DNA back out and sequence something else. And that allows you to really focus sort of an order of magnitude increase on the, the the amount of useful DNA that comes out of that sequencer. Um, so yeah, I think Nanopore has lots of really cool hackable features and probably has more of a, a potential for the future. Whereas Illumina, I can't really remember last time Illumina really innovated rather than just doing more sort of large scale high throughput sequencing. Um, but yeah, they're 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 good for different applications essentially. It sort of depends on the application and what what is the best sequencing technology. Uh, do, do you think though that it will be able to overcome some of the limitations as far as accuracy uh, based on on what you know? Um, yeah, so one of the things you can do with some of these long read sequencers, although I don't think you can do it with Nanopore, um, but PacBio is, is not a long, uh, long read sequencer. There you can actually circularize your DNA and just read a, around the circle multiple times and reduce your error rate that way. I don't think that works with Nanopore though. Um, for nanopore, you're just going to have to accumulate enough data to overlap all your noisy reads and uh, improve your sequencing quality that way. So uh, you would have to you'd have to essentially use a bunch of flow cells and get a bunch of different uh, sequences and then get, get a consensus or something. Is that is that what you're kind of saying? Yeah, it, it all depends on what you're sequencing, right? Are you doing a whole genome sequence? Are you doing uh, are you doing like a mammalian genome or are you doing something small like a bacterial or yeast genome? Um, so what, yeah. what a lot of people do is they'll use the longer read technologies to assemble a scaffold for a de novo and then they'll mm -hmm. use the shorter reads to sort of improve accuracy um, yeah. because it's really hard to assemble a whole new genome from the tiny little bits, but they're more accurate. So they're often paired together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. I very, very much appreciate you answering that. Thank you. 
but definitely having your own sequencer in house, you know, they're fairly inexpensive, and there, there's actually an, uh, a new version coming out that's even more inexpensive. That's going to be below five hundred dollars. Uh, you know, having your own sequencing capacity is really nice. Yeah, I saw they were developing something that attaches to your phone, which I thought yep. was mind blowing. It's sort of size of a USB stick, essentially. Cool. Th thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you all for still sticking with us. Um, I will finish us off by talking about open insulin. Um, I will apologize. I didn't know I was going to be doing this presentation until midway through this um, showcase. So <laughs> I'm not terribly familiar with the slides. So uh, if anyone else on the open insulin project uh, wants to jump in and help out at any point, please do. Oh, oh Jessica. Um... I mean, if you don't want to, I do have a slideshow. Uh, if it's up to you, was yours more um, focused on the science or? Because I think this is a very broad overview set of slides. Okay. Um, can I do mine next week then? Uh, yeah. Why, um, so I think Tim is organizing next week. So okay. why um, don't you two get together and we'll figure out. Okay. I, I mean, I could also do it the following week. Okay. Yeah, David, send me an email and uh, we, we can figure that out. Okay, cool. Cool. All right. So open insulin. Let me figure out how to move my slides here. Um, so the, the project is, is exists to help solve the insulin crisis. And in the US, uh, nearly one in two adults are living with either diabetes or prediabetes. And you can see that this is growing um, very rapidly throughout the US. And it's also um, becoming a huge problem in the developing world as people um, adopt a more Western style diet. And so this is becoming a worldwide problem. Um, and worldwide, uh, the insulin market is, 96% um, of it is controlled by three companies, Nova Nordisk, Sanofi, and Eli Lilly. Um, with only 4% being other companies. And so you can see this is um, pretty much a monopoly or an oligarch oligopoly. Um, and they keep raising the prices. So over uh, 20 years, it's increased about nine times. You can see in 1972, your dose of insulin cost about $9. Um, and in 2007, which is I believe the last uh, year that the accurate data is available at this point, it's up to about $275 a vial. And they're doing this just because they can, um, because there's very low competition. Um, they're free to keep raising the prices and they actually seem to raise them um, sort of together. So one will raise it and then the others all do it. Um, and this is despite very little innovation in the market. Um, the insulin has been around for a very long time um, and there is some improvement, but it's still essentially the same molecule. Um, one in four people have reported rationing their insulin. Um, and if you start to ration your insulin, um, it can lead to all sorts of severe consequences like blindness, kidney failure, heart disease, stroke, loss of limb, and even death. And there was a case um, where a young man, um, less than a year outside of his parents' health insurance um, when he had to go off it, uh, actually died because of insulin rationing. So this is a real problem. Um, so what are we trying, what are we trying to do? Um, we're trying to uh, have a revolutionary open source model um, as an alternative to this uh, oligolop, I can't even say that word, um, the highly concentrated uh, pharmaceutical industry to allow affordable life saving in insulin for vulnerable populations. Um, and our goal is to have the intellectual property remain in the commons. Uh, in the US, it's a very, very complicated supply chain. Um, so you can see that it starts off with the drug manufacturer and it goes through pharmacy benefit manufacturers, drug companies, wholesalers, pharmacies before it can actually get to the consumer. Um, and so all of this, every one of these people wants to take a, a profit. And so at each point that somebody touches it, it becomes more expensive. Um, and so we'd like to very much streamline that where we make it uh, in a compete. Uh, we develop the protocols in the community bio labs. Um, we produce it in conjunction with pharmacies and hospitals um, right at the source and get it to the actual people who need to use it. 
Um, so we're trying to develop open source insulin uh, protocols, not just the strains, but also the purification and all of the steps along with that. Um, there are two basic forms of insulin that we're working on, Lispro, Lispro and Glargine, um, uh, slow and fast acting. Um, and people do use both types depending on their diabetes to manage them. We're looking to produce them um, in E. coli and Pickia pastoris, so a bacteria and a yeast. Um, and this is based on uh, what's um, not under patent. So we're looking to find ways to produce these drugs that, have, that we have freedom to operate on um, so that we don't have to pay anybody to use them. Um, and then we work out uh, purification, separation, and all of that as well. Um, we have a very diverse team. We're working on everything from strategy, finance, legal, science, uh, regulatory, which isn't on here, but we do, and business. Um, we have a whole bunch of different groups and we're all working together. Uh, we're a horizontal organization and we have all sorts of different working groups. Um, there's a science group. Uh, David here is uh, one of our main workers in that. Um, communication, which we, um, you know, get the message out, create, uh, do, do our um, social media. Uh, business is one of our more revolutionary parts of this. Um, the science is well known. People have been making insulin for a century. Um, and so the method of producing insulin though, open source, I mean, any drug open source um, is novel and revolutionary. I've um, been working together with the, the legal policy and regulatory groups on this. Um, it's a whole new way of doing science and making drugs. Um, and so we, we expect to have some hurdles based on this. Um, and in fact, how you get funded and everything is, um, you know, we have to develop whole new ways of doing it because most drugs are funded through venture capital and we're not doing that. Um, we also have a hardware group, um, which is developing open source equipment um, to work on that. And that's a great one for people remotely because it's all over the world. Um, we have software. And then one of the truly unique aspects of this project too is the Open In Insulin and Society Group, um, which works on contextualizing, theorizing, and analyzing open insulin's place in contemporary society. Um, and this again is very novel. Um, each one of these is a working group right now. Um, and so we have a main, um, a main uh, session, which is every Sunday at noon uh, Pacific time. Um, but we also run um, info sessions for anybody who wants to join us as a new member. They typically happen um, the last Sunday of the month, but we're actually going to do another one this Sunday um, to capitalize on the new year and any of you guys who might want to join. Um, you can join the meetings. There's a whole link to how they're there at that Linktree meeting. Um, we use Mattermost, so you can come and introduce yourself there um, and then follow us on social media. And that's what I have. Does anyone have any questions or anything on that? Or anybody want to add anything? I don't know how much you have, David. I ran through it really quickly if you wanted to also. Um, no, I'll just, I'll do it next time. Okay, great. So Open Insulin is by far our largest project with uh, collaborators on what, seven continents now? <laughs> I don't know if we've gotten all seven, but we're getting there. Yeah, we have people in nope. Africa. And... Nobody working with in Antarctica yet? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. But... Nobody's working in NASA yet right. either. Five continents, five. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's a really interesting, fun project. I ran through it really quickly um, to try to save some time. Everybody get home. Uh, Get the body in a reasonable hour. And so Open Insulin is also one of the projects where we do still have lab work going on at Counterculture Labs. So we've made exceptions for a few individuals uh, with high priority projects. So Open Insulin is part of that because it's, uh, you know, it's a medical project. Same thing with Eddie is uh, working on uh, the Griffithson project at Counterculture Labs. Um, if there are other people that have what they consider uh, uh, a project that is really deserving of having people actually in the lab using the wet lab, uh, talk to us and uh, we can make more exceptions if that makes sense. So. Um, Patrick, 
Yeah. What um, I mean, where are we right now with regard to lockdown and everything about like what kinds of projects count as uh, you know, uh, exceptional because medical easy to justify if it's just mm -hmm. like well it's a normal project and we think we can do it safely is that something we would consider at this point or are we going to wait till we go back down to uh orange alert so um the live streaming we would love to do i think we can justify that under remote learning i mean there's definitely exceptions for that as well in uh sort of the current lockdown language officially um, if it's just, you know, a personal project, like I haven't touched uh, kombucha genomics stuff at all since we locked down. I haven't even maintained the, the library of like a dozen different kombucha cultures that we had at CCL. Um, it, we would have to have a really good reason to justify it. And I think distance learning is a really good reason. Uh, any kind of medical projects those can be good reasons as well um yeah okay great yeah maybe we can set uh, up a some kind of a distance live stream or something for a, a robotic session yeah yeah i think that would be awesome um so um before we i think do we have any more presentations queued up I think we, we okay. covered all the projects. All right. uh, so a couple of other things that are coming up at Counterculture Labs and hopefully in January or some, some maybe a little bit later. Um, I'm hoping to start a new series of meetups on uh, 3D modeling, both for engineering purposes and for bio art. Uh, so you've already seen sort of the modification to the gene gun that uh, Tan and, and the folks at the Griffithson project have been working on. So that is all an excellent example of some nice 3D design for engineering. Um, I've been building some parts for the Mascomatic project. Uh, there's some really cool uh, tools that can be used for by art and design. Um, but it all sort of falls under the same category of, of uh, 3D design, essentially. Um, so we would likely alternate between art applications and engineering applications. And if anybody is interested in uh, perhaps uh, teaching a session on a topic, uh, talk to me. And uh, hoping to have our first session uh, sometime in the next week or two. Um, let's see. Uh, Remy or Jessica, do you want to say something about uh, anti-racism workshops? Yeah, I think Remy jumped off, so I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. I just put a, a link in the chat to a survey that we put out um, mm -hmm. about um, what people would like to see. But we um, are going to run a series of workshops to deal with sort of anti-racist um, actions and sort of building equity and equality and all that into our the way we set things up. Um, and so we're still in the early planning stages of, of how those um, sessions will look, but um, we put together a survey that we would love people's feedback on um, what they would like to see come out of these sessions to help us sort of plan them. But we envision, I think, three or four different sessions where we have people, uh, we have some facilitators come in and, and help us um, figure out an action plan build inclusion and all that. Yeah, so stay tuned. Lots of things happening. Um, I know over the holidays, there's always sort of a, a, a slower period at the community labs. So we've seen that in previous years as well. Uh, but I expect we will have a lot more uh, activity and events happening in January and February. So looking forward to that. Yeah, thank you everyone for um, who presented and for who listened and stayed on um, about an hour longer than I thought it would take. <laughs> but uh, I think we talked about some great science. So thanks everybody. Thanks for putting this on, Jessica and Patrick. All right, well, thank you all for joining us and uh, have a good evening. Yeah, thank you. All right, bye. Thank you. Hi, all. Thanks a lot. Bye, bye. Good, everybody. Thank bye. you much.